So now that we've established what happens at the postsynaptic potential and how it causes excitatory or inhibitory events, we're going to take this and put it into more context. And that context is specifically going to be in regards to the changes that happen at synapses. We'll entitle this next flowchart Synaptic Connection Changes. And what we often think of when we think of synapses is the fact that these are stable and very static things. But in reality, these synapses have the capability of changing, and this change actually underlies much of our own memory and learning capacities as human beings. So it's worthy of understanding how these changes occur and what these changes result in on both a functional and structural level. So let's take a look. Broadly speaking, if we understand the nervous system and its development, we know that the nervous system is established during embryonic development. So let's state that. Nervous system established during embryonic development. So this means that as an embryo that's developing, we've gone through that over two lectures, we understand that the nervous system is going to differentiate, it's going to specialize, and it's going to become the nervous system that an infant is born with. Overall, that structure will be the following. So the overall structure of this developing nervous system as a result of this embryonic development will be in regards or I, I, due to the fact that you're going to have tons of regulated gene expression. And if you remember all the way from bio 1, this simply means that some genes will be turned on, some genes will be turned off. The genes associated with, let's say, making a brain will be on in the brain region. And the genes associated with making a spinal cord will be on in the spinal cord region. And you're going to have this very much regulated form of gene expression to ensure that the nervous system is developmentally correctly placed and organized and functionally successful. So that's our regulated gene expression idea in terms of how it fits within the overall structure. And in addition, another main component of this overall structure will be signal transduction. This is the idea that certain processes that occur within this developmental scheme and sequence are going to rely on signals to occur in the correct manner. You're going to have to have the correct order and sequence of development through this process of signal transduction, which is directly related to and interconnected with the idea of regulated gene expression. So that's our basic understanding here, that the nervous system develops embryonically through regulated gene expression, through signal transduction to give us the overall structure that we're used to. But this is the idea that's critical to understanding this idea of this lecture, the changes that can happen. The nervous system is very much capable of change and definitely evolving more than, let's say, the fact that you're born with a certain brain and the connections that are there. There are going to be changes. And we'll state this as the following. The brain itself, the king of the nervous system, that structure will continue, and it does continue to develop and remodel itself. Okay, The key word here is continues to develop and also remodel. So it shows that the brain is not this static structure. It's very much a plastic structure, a structure that can be manipulated and changed depending on the certain situations that we are uh, providing the brain. Now let's take a look. In terms of the idea of the brain continuing this development, one critical example of this is the competition that occurs within the brain. So this is an intrinsic competition within the brain, specifically neurons themselves. So there's a competition amongst neurons within a developing brain. And how is this competition laid out? Basically, you have these neurons that are going to fight each other for what are known as growth factors. Okay. So neurons themselves, as they're developing, will fight for and compete for growth-supporting factors. Those neurons that do get the growth-supporting factors in the amount that they need will continue to develop, and those that don't will deteriorate and die. So that's the clear example of the brain changing, and this can happen post-birth as well. So the change that's happening here is neurons are either being eliminated, the ones that are not successfully getting these growth-supporting factors, or the ones that are successfully getting them are developing further. And this is good because... What we're basically going to get rid of are any faulty neurons, neurons that aren't going to be successful later on in life. This is actually the reason about half of the neurons that go away within the em embryonic brain are going to go away because of this competition for those growth factors. Another sort of example of the brain changing is the idea of synapse elimination. And this is also an event that occurs during embryonic development and also after embryonic development. 
in this situation, what you're going to have are the synapses, which are the connections between neurons. Remember, those gaps, those junctions, they will be eliminated, the ones that are faulty, the ones that are not as good as the others. So you're going to basically get rid of stuff that's not working well or does not look like it's going to work well in an attempt to remodel the brain, in an attempt to establish a very efficient nervous system. So now, let's take a look at this idea of brain plasticity and look at it at more of a cellular level because this is a very broad stroke idea here. What we can sort of develop further from this understanding is the fact that the brain as a result of this development, as a result of this change, will undergo something known as neuronal plasticity. It will exhibit neuronal plasticity. Now, neuronal plasticity is shown in figure 49.10. And when we think of something as having a plasticity, it means that it can change. It has the ability to be modified. And the neurons, which are the components and key functional units of the nervous system, can do this. Okay, So we're going to state the following. Specifically, the connections, those synapses, can be modified. We'll state that neuronal connections aka synapses. That's just a different way of saying synapses. These are structures that can and will be modified throughout your life. Okay. Now, this is going to result in nervous system remodeling. But the remodeling itself as an overall process is actually directly dependent on one thing. The nervous system remodeling that is possible within our brains is based on the activity that you carry out every single day or the activity that you do on a large scale. So the environmental activities that you expose your brain to can directly modify the neuronal connections within your brain. So now we have to absolutely understand that the brain is not this structure that just stays the way it is the moment it's born. There's clearly changes that are possible and those changes are going to occur at the neuronal connections. Those changes, the remodeling that we talked about prior the remodeling itself occurs at neuronal connections known as synapses. Thus the name of this flowchart, synaptic connection changes. And this is part one. So the, what is the remodeling that occurs here? Essentially, it goes down like this. You're going to have these synapses, which are just connections between neurons. And these connections that are present may be reinforced. When we say reinforced here, we mean the connections get stronger. And this is going to occur as a result of activity. But what type of activity? The connections are reinforced when the activity of the neuron that's in question, the activity of neuron, directly coincides with other neurons. Coincides means that it goes with other neurons. Okay, It's basically working together with other neurons doing the same job. It's a team effort that's occurring, and if this team effort is occurring on a broad sort of uh, connective level, what you're going to gain is a reinforcement of connections. Connections that are stronger, faster, better, that just work more cohesively so long as the activity being done is coinciding. It's going along with the other neurons doing much the same activity. In contrast, these connections may also get weaker. So it's not necessarily that your brain can develop positively, but it can also develop negatively. And those connections, the synapses that we mentioned, they may also get weaker in certain situations. Those situations are, again, directly tied to the activity that you do. And these connections will get weaker if the activity that's being done doesn't coincide with other neurons. Okay, It doesn't coincide. If you're doing these haphazard, random activities that are not directly in relation to completing a certain goal, let's say, you will not have stronger connections form as a result of this uh, unconnected, as a result of this uh, non-reinforced activity that you're doing here. The big idea to understand about this is the fact that you are going to create these connections, whether they're stronger or weaker, based off of the simple phrase of use it, or lose it. If you are doing certain activities to promote the coinciding effect of many neurons, if you're doing something that involves many neurons working together, you're going to have greater connection reinforcement. And if you're not doing that, you will lose that reinforcement. And that will happen as a result of neuronal plasticity.
In the next flowchart and video, we'll continue this discussion on the synaptic changes by looking more directly at how this relates to memory and learning and also the process of long-term potentiation.